Solomon was made king in 1 Kings chapter 1. The material we are using skips chapters 2, 3, and 4. I'll give a brief overview of that material. In those chapters, David first gave instructions to Solomon about things he needed to take care of in establishing his kingdom. In chapter 2 and verse 3, David told Solomon to keep the charge of the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart, and with all their soul, he said, You shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. David then gave Solomon instructions regarding whom he should execute. David's death is mentioned in the rest of chapter 2, and then, I'm sorry, yes, the rest of chapter 2 tells about Solomon executing Adonijah and a Joab and another less known individual. Chapter 3 tells of Solomon's request for wisdom, and it tells of God granting him that request. The rest of chapter 3 tells the story, a very famous story, which emphasizes Solomon's wisdom. It's the story of two women, both of whom had small infants. One of the babies died in the middle of the night, and the mother switched babies with the other mother while she was asleep. Each claimed that the living child was their own son when they came to Solomon, and to settle the matter, he instructed that a sword be brought, and to divide the living child in two and give one half to each mother. The responses from the two mothers revealed which one was the true mother of the living infant. Chapter 4 gives names of those who are in Solomon's administration, and the latter part of the chapter details Solomon's prosperity and emphasizes his wisdom. I'll read a few verses from that section, starting with verse 20. It says, The people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They ate, they drank, and they were happy. Verse 26 and 27 following says, Solomon had 4,000 stalls for chariot horses and 12,000 horses. The district governors each in his month supplied provisions for King Solomon and all who came to the king's table. They saw to it that nothing was lacking. They also brought to the, pop, to the proper place their quotas of barley and straw for the chariot horses and the other horses. Starting in verse 29, talks about Solomon's wisdom. It said, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the east and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. Verse 32 through 34 says he spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fishes. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. Today we'll be covering chapters 5 through 9, which primarily talks about Solomon building and dedicating the temple and other building projects. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, introduces us to a man named Hiram. Hiram had been a friend of and an, and an ally of King David. We are first introduced to him back in 2 Samuel chapter 5. Hiram was a Phoenician king who ruled over Tyre for 34 years. On the map here, this area right here is Phoenicia, you see. And this is the city of Tyre, which is also prominent in the New Testament. Um, we'll see a little bit more on this in, in a few minutes. But uh, so, Again, Hiram was a Phoenician king, a king of Phoenicia, who ruled over Tyre for 34 years. God had not allowed David to build the temple because David had fought so many wars. But there was peace in the days of Solomon, and he would be allowed to build the temple. The principal ma building material in Jerusalem was limestone. 
and this would be used in building the temple, but they were also going to use wood. And since Israel did not have cedar forests like those in Lebanon, the Israelites did not have workmen skilled in building with it. The forest of Lebanon was a region north of Tyre, pointed out on this not so nice looking map. The forest of Lebanon here, this is Tyre, so it's the region north of that area. This area here. And Lebanon means the white one, and some think that it probably refers to the snow-capped peaks of the Lebanon mountains located in Phoenicia. Solomon's temple and the temple that was built after the Babylonian captivity were both built with the cedars of Lebanon. Ezra chapter 3 verse 7 refers to that second temple. The people would really begin to understand what Samuel meant when he had told them that the king would take their sons as workers. We find in chapter 5 that Solomon conscripted 30,000 men to work on this project. And this would become a problem issue for Rehoboam once he became king, Solomon's son who took his place after him. The people asked Rehoboam to lighten the burdensome service of his father, and they would serve him. He refused to do so, and he lost more than half of his kingdom as a result. In chapter 6, verse 1, we are told that Solomon began building the house of the Lord in the 480th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt. Here are some numbers. It's accepted that Solomon died in 930 B.C., and the text tells us this was his fourth year as king. This means he began building the temple in 966 B.C., and that places the Exodus in 1446 B.C. In chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, God made it clear that the temple was not that which would bring God's blessings on Solomon and Israel, not just because they built the temple, not just because the temple was in Jerusalem. God was not somehow obligated to bless them. It was whether Solomon and, by extension, the people would walk in God's ways. The text says, verses 12 and 13 of chapter 6, As for this temple you are building, if you follow my decrees, observe my laws, and keep all my commands and obey them, I will fulfill through you the promise I gave to David your father and I will live among the Israelites and will not abandon my people Israel. Chapter 6, verse 38 tells us that it took seven years for Solomon to build the temple. Then chapter 7, verse 1 says that Solomon took 13 years to build his own house. He also used cedars from Lebanon for that project. Based on the time stated in chapter 8, verse 2, the ark was brought into the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles. <clears throat> it was placed in the most holy place, which was the back portion of the tabernacle of the temple. <clears throat> Verse 9 tells us that nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses had put there at Horeb. And just as a cloud had, had covered the tabernacle when Moses and the people of Israel set it up, <clears throat> and God's glory had filled it when it was inaugurated back there in chapter 40 of Exodus. So now we're told that a cloud filled the temple. This visible presence of God's dwelling with his people gave them assurance, and it gave them incentive for obedient and holy living. <clears throat> in chapter 8, verse 13, Solomon said he had built an exalted house for God a place for him to dwell in forever. The New, Testament, the New Testament tells us that we are the temple of God and that God dwells in us, his people, the church. Though Solomon had said he built a temple for God to dwell in, he acknowledged in verse 27 that the heavens, that the heavens themselves cannot even contain God, let alone the temple that he had just built. In Solomon's prayer of dedication, he repeatedly called on God to forgive his people when they have sinned. Solomon noted that not one word that God had promised through Moses had failed. 
because of the tremendous number of suffering uh, offerings. I'm sorry, trying to read three things at once here. Because of the tremendous number of offerings, Solomon held a feast to share the abundance of meat. After seven days, we're told that he sent the people home and continued the feast for another seven days. Chapter 9. Again, we see that God's promise of blessing is repeatedly based on walking before him in uprightness. I'll end on that note. I'll read chapter 9, verses 4 through 9. The text says, As for you, if you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and if you do all I command and observe, and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father when I said you shall never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. But if you or your descendants turn away from me, and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you, and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut Israel off from the land I have given them, and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Israel will, will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. This temple will become a heap of rubble. All who pass by will be appalled and will scoff and say, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? People will answer, Because they have forsaken the Lord their God, who brought their ancestors out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why the Lord brought all this disaster on them. Next week will be our last class in the United Kingdom period. We will look at chapters 12 and 13, which discuss Solomon's wisdom, his visit from the Queen of Sheba, and his falling away from the Lord. These, this, this last topic will prepare us for the divided kingdom, his, his falling away prepares us for the divided kingdom, which begins in chapter 13. Brent Fountain will be teaching that class on the divided kingdom on Sundays, beginning on Sunday, July 5th. On Wednesday, July 1st, two weeks from today, I will begin teaching the book of Acts. If you've not received a text or email regarding that material, feel free to contact me.